has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing with joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Hallelujah. Father God, we bless your name this morning. Because we know, Father, that you are in our midst today. We know that you inhabit the praises of your people, Father. So we promise today to enter your gates with thanksgiving and enter your courts with praise. We pray, Father, that you'll purify our hearts and sanctify our minds, Lord. Let there be nothing that stands between us so today, oh God. We pray that there be no barrier, Father, that there would be an open heaven, that you would pour out blessing upon blessing, Lord, that you'll make your will known to us today. So bless us, Father. Bless our musicians as they offer their gifts to you, oh Lord. Bless the choir as they open their mouths and bring you glory. Bless, Father God, everyone who stands in this place, everyone who walks into these doors. Bless those, Father, who walk by today. And may the glory of God just, just flow from the door of this house. That the nations might know that the God that we serve is real. That you're still a healer. That you're still a burden bearer. That you can still move mountains on behalf of your people. So receive today, Father God, this offering, this praise, and this worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Come on, get a moment and give God some glory. Come on, stand on your feet this morning and give God glory. Come on, God. Thank you, Lord.
in the name of Jesus. And I want that to be kind of the focus of where we enter into this time of prayer and praise it because my Bible says that there's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. That in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And this is the part some folks miss is they said not every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. We need to realize where these knees are bowing. Every knee will bow in heaven. That means in the heavenly realms, that dimension that you can't see, that dimension where the real spiritual warfare happens, at the name of Jesus, every knee bows in the heavenly realm. And every knee bows in the earthly realm. That means there is no natural power greater than the name yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. Every knee shall bow in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. That means in the dark places. That means in the places where Satan runs roughshod in our lives. Those, those sometimes those secret things that we don't want other people to know, but there is power in the name of Jesus. Now watch this. I think too often we forget that there's power in the name because sometimes we use it not expecting power from it. The Bible says we're not supposed to take the name of the Lord in vain. You, you remember the story of the little boy that cried wolf? And every time he cried wolf, people would come running. But it turns out he really didn't see a wolf. And so his ability to get help diminished because he called for help when it wasn't needed. The name of Jesus is a holy name. The name of Jesus is our access point into the very presence of Almighty God. And so the power in the name of Jesus is directly tied to your expectation when you use it. Because if you use the name of Jesus without expecting him to arrive, how can we expect him to arrive when we use it? See, when I dial 911, there's an expectation that somebody's going to be on the other line and that they're going to come when I call. But if I dial 911 and there's not an emergency, if I dial 911 and the people on the other line start realizing he don't want nothing, so when you hear 911 from this number, don't call anymore. Come on, I know that Jesus hears us. Can you take me down a little bit? I'll take me with him, I don't need The Bible says that when we call on the name of Jesus, that he hears us, and he answers us, and he moves on our behalf. And because every knee bows, when we invoke that name, I'm expecting every knee to bow. I'm expecting sickness to bow. I'm expecting depression to bow. I'm expecting divine powers to bow. I'm expecting the, the, the plans of the enemy to bow when we call on the name of Jesus. And there's something about calling on his name together. There's something about a group of people coming together in prayer and invoking the name of Jesus. So not only do we worship in his name, we pray in his name. We approach the throne of grace at the invitation of our Savior. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you've been struggling this week, if you're struggling right now, if you simply want to give God glory that his name is due, why don't you make your way to the altar and let's call on the name of Jesus together. Let's lean on our brothers and sisters because somebody in this place needs a special touch today. Somebody in this place needs to know that my God is real and they need to feel somebody's hands on their shoulder. They need to hear somebody's voice in their ear. Come on, let's make Jesus real by representing him to those that are around us. Let your hands be his hands this morning. Let your touch be his touch this morning because my God is able. I don't know about yours, but my God is able. And when I call on the name of Jesus, I'm expecting that able God to show up. All praises be to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, press in close. Press in close. Get as close to the altar as possible. Press in. Let there be no gaps. Let there be no separation. Let there be no place that the enemy can wedge himself in. When we come together, we guard each other's spirits. We guard each other's hearts. We protect each other as the family of God today. And as you stand in this place, I want you to believe and know 
that God is already aware of what you need. He knows what you need before you ask. But he says, ask of me and I will give. Seek of me and you will find not today. And the very doors of heaven shall be opened. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, O oh Lord. We have opened our mouths, Father God, in songs of worship. We have lifted our hands, Father God, as a sign of adoration, confession, and our need for more of you. We stand, Father God, in awe of your greatness, thanking you for being such a, such a gentle, loving, compassionate Father. Thank you, Lord, for blotting out our sins time and time again. Thank you for hearing us, Lord, even when we cry from places that we have created. Thank you, Father God, for cleaning up our messes, for carrying us through our burdens and our circumstances, for showing up, oh God, in times when we thought that we were about to throw in the towel. Thank you for being a very present help in our time of trouble. But Father God, we also thank you that by your word and by your spirit, you equip us, Lord, so that we might grow up in you. That we might take your word in our mouths ourselves and speak those blessings, speak those truths. Pray, Father God, for the power to be released to us and through us so that the world might know, Father, that our God is real. You do not stand at a distance and we have to approach you on a mountain anymore. By your spirit, oh God, you have come to dwell among us. You have come, Father God, to inhabit, to dwell in the midst of your people, to dwell in the temple, Father God, of the bodies that we prepare for you. Glorify yourself in this house, oh God, right now, by making your presence known. I pray, Father, for those whose hearts are heavy. I pray for those, Father God, who have tears in their eyes. I pray for those, Father God, who have been struggling all week long just to make sense of life. I pray for those, Father God, that have been struggling all week long to make ends meet. I pray, Father God, for those that have been going through all week long, wondering when their breakthrough is going to come. Father, I pray today that you will make your presence known. I pray today that you will reveal your glory. I pray today that you will move this mountain, Father God. Heal this disease. Glorify yourself in this hour. No matter what is happening in this place. At the name. In the name of Jesus. We declare, Father God, that we are your people. And the sheep of your pasture. That you are the good shepherd, O oh Lord. And you will never leave us. Nor forsake us. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, teach us, Lord, not to be afraid. Teach us, Father God, that you will prepare a table before us in the very presence of our enemies. And Lord, a thousand may fall at our side, ten thousand may fall at our right hand, but it will not come near us if we learn how to abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. Lord, it's when we get away from you. It's when we're not reading. It's when we're not praying. It's when we're not paying attention. That the enemy, like a roaring lion, seeks those whom he may devour. And I believe, Father God, that there are those that have felt the attack of the enemy. That like a lion, Satan has run roughshod through someone's relationships. Run roughshod through someone's financial world. Run roughshod, Lord, over someone's dreams, someone's hopes, someone's desires. Because his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Lord, in your name, you said that you came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Pray, Lord, that you restore, even today, that which the enemy has taken from your people. If he has stolen joy, I pray that you return it a hundred times over. If he has stolen dreams, Father God, I pray that you restore our ability to dream again, to hope again, to love again, to believe again. Because you are the great I am of our lives. You are, Father God, therefore we stand. You are, Father God, therefore we believe. You are, Father God, therefore we shall receive from you everything that we need to accomplish
accomplish your purpose in us for all things work together for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. I pray, Lord, that our eyes be opened unto your purpose for our lives. Show us why we're here. Show us what we ought to accomplish. Release, I pray, the resources of heaven so that we might do the things that bring you glory this time. Father God, heal every disease. Move every mountain. Be glorified for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for God to the pulling down of strongholds. We demolish strongholds. We uproot bitterness. We resist the devil. And in Jesus' name, he will flee. So be glorified. Magnified, exalted in this place. In Jesus' name. Come on, shout it in.
Tell folks how wonderful God is to you. And take your time. We just give your time. God will be real brief. You just struck me. I just remembered. Um, I do have rice and clothes. Um,
protected you from enemies with larger armies. I provided for you when the rest of the world was starving. You drank water from a rock. You picked up manna from the ground. And now, God told them, when you reach that place of plenty, Lives his life. 
then he finds out that that was not satisfying after wasting his whole time. Paul says this, there's, there's this key moment in the story. It says, he came to himself and he thought about his father's house. And he came back in total humility. He said to himself, I'm going to go back, not to get back in my old job or step back in my old place, but I'm going to go back and say, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And I think that's how we have to come back to God is on our knees and on our faces. But the God that we serve, so that you know, is a God who receives us where we are, but then he lifts us. Humble yourself under the hand of Almighty God and lift you. And so the son was restored completely. He was given a robe, a regal robe. He was given a royal ring, a signet ring, and sandals put on his feet. And my prayer today is that whether this is the house that you remain in, just come and ride with us for a while. Yeah. This is a safe place. And you can jump, amen. You can shout, amen.
because my father is with me. But then he also realized that there were some folks close enough to him that he could confide in. Those 11 brothers started with 12. You know Judas was not really included. But Jesus reached that place where he said, you know what, even though I'm only going to be here just a few short hours more, I want you to know that our relationship has changed. Jesus said, I don't call you servants anymore. Because a servant does not know his master's business. He said, from now on, I call you friends. Being someone's friends means that you have access to them that not anyone else has. Access to information. Access to resources. Access to just fellowship. In my Bible, not my Bible, the old hymnals. What a friend. We have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we offer for. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not care.
on Wednesday the 20th. I think Pastor Nick is going to talk about that, so I'll just hold, hold off because that's dealing with our corporate prayer and fasting. Our annual business meeting is going to follow on September 23rd, September, November 23rd at 10, where again we're going to elect our officers and take care of our church business. Also, our scholarship committee has a new and exciting way for the Friendship Pasadena family to contribute to our graduating youth going to college. It's called Amazon Smile. Anybody shop Amazon? Okay, anybody not shop on Amazon? This is an opportunity for us through our shopping habits for um, us to receive a benefit, a financial benefit that we have uh, designated for our scholarship committee. You remember that we were doing and still are doing the script program, that if uh, you are signed up with a script program every time that you shop at uh, various places, I think it's Vons and uh, Food, Food for Less and Ralph's perhaps, that every time you swipe that, that, that card, there is a portion of those funds that comes to friendship. If you spend $100, you get $100 worth of your groceries, but those businesses, because we are giving them business, they carve out a portion of that every time you eat. Amen. Amen. You sow a seed into the, the ongoing educational pursuits of our young people here in this church. And Amazon Smile is that same type of thing. Whenever you shop on Amazon, make sure to change your charity to friendship. This is Friendship Baptist. Is, are we still listed? Yes. Yes? Okay, so Friendship Baptist Church will adjust that in the near future. To ensure the donation is sent to Friendship at all at no extra cost to you. So if you guys know how to work about Amazon, make that change and we will be blessed and so will you. Family Promise of San Gabriel. Fair trade holiday shopping begins this Friday. Amen. November 15th. That's a, that's a Black Friday for Family Promise. Amen. Um, at 6 p.m. and ends November 30th at 10,000 Villages on South Lake. 15% of your entire purchase will be donated to the Family Promise of San Gabriel. Amen. Family Promise again. Amen. Family Promise is not just something that we do. It's who we are. It's an opportunity for us to demonstrate that we really are connected to the Lord. Uh, two more uh, announcements. Uh, first is going to be the women's announcement regarding the Christmas, I think that's fundraiser, and then also right after that, Pastor Nick, regarding our corporate fasting and prayer. Women's announcement, where's it coming from? Sister, receive Sister Terrell this morning. Come on, clap like you like her this morning. Like to fast. 
And we have four different options that primarily deal with uh, food and fasting. And we want you guys to look those over and possibly take an option from this list to implement during those days of the 18th to the 20th, which is next week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Also, next Sunday, I will be preaching on fasting and prayer. So I really believe that the Lord is setting us up for a very, very powerful time in his presence and a very, very powerful move of his spirit. I think things are lining up perfectly for us to be able to do that again. That time is Monday, November 18th, and it ends Wednesday, November 20th, right here at church at 7 p.m. Each and every small group, we are calling on all of the small groups to come and gather during that time, to come and pray along with your church family. We really want to continue to unify our efforts as small groups and as the pastor over small groups. I'm really calling and asking everybody to be in attendance if you can make it that Wednesday at 7 p.m. as we begin to transition this gathering into a time where we all get to meet up, pray together, call on the Lord together, and, and be strengthened by the Lord in that time. Amen? Amen? Amen. So please remember the date. Take some time to look over these options. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means to fast and pray, and the Lord will most certainly meet us in our efforts. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. A prayer saturated church. Yeah. Not just prayer that, that just uh, puts out fires. Right. Deals with problems. Right. But a saturated house of worship. Again, Jesus drove people out of the church. It always tickles me still when people say, well, what would Jesus do? And sometimes when I hear that, I think people see this, this Jesus that just, you know, kind of goes along to get along and doesn't want to make anybody feel bad about themselves. But if you study Jesus at all, when it came to the honor of his father, Jesus didn't play. My Bible says that Jesus, he made a whip. Like, he didn't go buy one at the 99 cent store. Jesus made a whip and beat people out of the temple because they had made it something that did not glorify God. God forbid that whatever we do in this church with all of the, again, all the things we're providing by way of ministry, that if we are not a house of prayer, that prayer is not at the forefront of our thinking, that we run the same risk of being driven out of God's presence. So let's make sure, amen, that we are praying together. And as Pastor Nick said, we are asking for all of our small groups. Bring your small groups. Sit together as a small group. All of your ministries. Come and sit together. Let all the trustees come and sit together as, as trustees, deacons, deaconess, whatever ministry there, there might be. And let's pray that as this year comes to a close, and should God grant us grace to see 2020, that 2020, I mean, can you remember being little? And somebody said 2020, and you knew we were going to be living on Mars and Cars are going to be flying. Cars are driving themselves now, so we've come a long way. But we are about to, again, by God's grace, enter into the year 2020 as the oldest black Baptist church in the city of Pasadena oh, who has undergone incredible changes that honors our past but makes us make disciples of all nations. Come on. This is going to be more and more each and every day. A house where all nations come to worship and give God glory. Can you thank God for what's going to happen? This is where we live. Not where we're going. Last time I said that, we started this problem, but amen, I still believe it. Now is the time we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Can you thank God for that? had some very um, honest conversations at our at the executive board level um, that pertain to the ministries that we perform and the services that we are able to provide for the people of this house and even for people outside of the four walls. And as much as we are a house of faith, we believe that God will provide because he has provided in incredible and miraculous ways. But primarily the support 
support of this house depends heavily upon the faithful giving of the membership of this place through our tithes and through our offerings. You make it possible for us to do the things that we do at the level that we do it. And so when the financial support lacks, that means that there's some things that we can't do the way we want to do. And yet, Amen. we will never stand before you and put any undue pressure other than the pressure, if it is pressure, of God's Word. You make it possible for families to get fed through your tithes and your offerings. You make it possible for needs to be met through your tithes and your offerings. You make it possible for this to happen through your tithes and your offerings. So realize that you're sowing into good soil when your tithe, which is 10% of your financial in income, or your offering, which is above and beyond that, is sown in, that, in this place. But whatever you're sowing today, take it as a gift, raise it before the Lord, and let's believe that what God is about to do is going to bring an incredible harvest. This is the offering I bring to God, the seed of faith I sow. I give it in faith, I give it in love, I give it in obedience. I believe the promise that He has made, and I shall reap the harvest that He has promised. However, He chooses to bring it my way. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you. For receiving from us, oh God, our worship. We pray, Lord, that it was pure. We pray that it was untainted. We pray, oh God, that it was acceptable and that you are pleased with it. We have prayed, oh God, and interceded on behalf of the sick, on behalf of the struggling, on behalf of your people. And we pray that our prayers have been in agreement with the leading of your spirit. Now, Father God, we sow our tithes and our offerings into the fertile soil of friendship, Pasadena Church. We pray, Lord, that you would treat it like a seed and that it would be, uh, provide an incredible harvest for the sower and for this house. Bless those, Lord, who have a desire today but may not have the means to sow. Increase their faith. Increase their sower of seed. Increase their joy in Jesus' name. Amen. You are now in the hands of your ushers.
means we are subjected to and the subjects of everything that God requires of us. God gives us instructions because he reigns. God gives us direction because he reigns. God rules over the affairs of our lives because he reigns forever. Someone said, if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. And that means everything in your life. I know I'm going to get unfollowed and have some folks on the That means your social media pages? Man, it got quiet quickly. That means if God reigns, that means he rules over it all. And the song said, listen, give him glory. Yes. I was telling Pastor Nick that in this message that I want to get to like right away, we're going to deal with what glory is what it means to give God glory. What it means when the Bible says Jesus said he gave us glory. And we throw that term around and I think sometimes we don't have a, a point of reference. Or if our point of reference is like mine has been, it's, it's somewhat incomplete. But I'm praying today again man, for God to grant grace in this moment. And so I, as they say, I solicit your prayers because I need them today. But take your Bibles in your hands because we're going to the Word of God as we always do. The Bible is our roadmap. It is our, the GPS system of, of heaven that if we ever get lost, if we ever get off track, all you got to do is call the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, just like you call on Siri and like you call whoever else you call, you call on Google and whatever. I, you know, I wonder whose phone would come on right now and say, Hey, Google! Hey, Siri! See whose phone is on. Take a Bible in your hand, raise it before the Lord, and only if you believe these words, only if you believe these words, let's say them together. Amen. This is my Bible. This is God's word speaking to me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. It is the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. With it I wage war against the enemy of my soul. I will fight the good fight. I will contend for the faith. I will hold the honor of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God this morning. Yes, please pray with and for me as we continue in this series Amen. Secret Place as we just keep walking with the Lord in St. John. We walk through it with him from the upper room of chapter 14, the place of transition leading towards the Garden of Gethsemane, chapter 15 and last week we talked about what Jesus meant when he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. God expects fruitfulness in our lives. Amen. Right. You know, the Father is so protective of the vine that Jesus said, I want you all to know that, that if you claim to be connected to me, but you're not producing fruit, he said, my Father's going to cut you off. And so fruitfulness becomes the measure of our connection because Jesus said that when you bear much fruit, we show ourselves to be his disciples. So fruitfulness for a believer is not an option. God does not like fruitlessness from the beginning of time. Even with Adam and Eve, he told them what man thinks he said, just go be fruitful and multiply. Even when he wiped out the earth with the flood, when he spoke to Noah, he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the whole earth. Jesus, at the end of his earth, earthly ministry, Matthew chapter 28, he gives us what's called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, reproduce yourself. God is looking for fruitfulness. And we found out that the fruitfulness of our lives is, it, it is really just what our life produces because of our connection to the Lord. Amen. That when we really love God, the things that we do, the, the how we demonstrate life when we go to the store. The, the, the warm spot might even be considered fruitfulness. The, the, the helpful hand could be considered as fruitfulness. Being with somebody in the midst of their grief can be evidence of the fruitfulness because the fruit of the Spirit is the Spirit's fruit for us. But the fruit that we bear is our fruit for the Lord. That's why Jesus said that if you don't bear fruit, God will, cut, God will cut us off. But if we do bear fruit, then we actually demonstrate we are connected to the vine. But this series on The Secret Place has been incredibly eye-opening for me. 
And as much as I have enjoyed teaching it to you, I have been challenged at a new level myself. I thank God that when the Lord is dropping things in my spirit for you, that much of what he is dropping for you also feeds me. There have been times when I've had to pray, Lord, as I'm reading, as I am praying, is this something I'm supposed to share by way of my pastoral gifting? Or is this something that I'm supposed to take and meditate on? So there's many times where God will drop things in my spirit and I will think that it's for you. And God will say, no, that's for you. That before you preach to others, make sure that you are practicing what you preach. And can, and can I tell you that that, that that should not just be a cliche thing for yeah. preachers that all of us in this room, I'm going to do this thing, nudge your neighbor and tell them, no, practice what you preach. Come on. Come on. Don't, don't tell me to do one thing and you do something else in time, right? But this thing has really been speaking to my heart. It's almost as though somebody had prayed that the eyes of our understanding would be open and that we would get to know the Lord better. Oh, and it's almost as if we've been seeking treasure in the field, and having found it, we're willing to sell everything else and buy that field. Y'all do know that that's what we've been praying for the last few years in this place. That God will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we might know it better. No matter how well you know the Lord, no matter how long you've walked in this faith journey, no matter what church you go to, no matter whether you speak in tongues or prophesy, you can move mountains or whatever. God is so deep and so wide and so vast and so incredible and so infinite that you can know more about God today and God can reveal something more to you in this very moment than you've learned your whole life. Amen. Because anytime that, that we believe that we've cornered the market on God's word and that we know everything that God is going to do, then your God is too small. All right. We serve a God that continues to show and reveal and make himself known. So we've been praying that God will give us a spirit of wisdom that's applying what we've already known. And revelation that God will continue to reveal his purpose and power for us so that we can know him better and serve him better. But now in this series we've reached John chapter 17. Having just left the upper room and we have walked with Jesus towards the Mount of Olives where he is going to be betrayed. But before he gets there... He pauses in St. John chapter 15 to pray with and for his disciples. And I want to eavesdrop again as he talks to his father because he mentions us that thousands of years ago, Jesus prayed a prayer that included you and I today. And so it's more than just a cliche that when Jesus died, you were on his mind. That when God sent his son into the world to accomplish what he accomplished, he did it because he knew that you would be in the world in desperate need of a savior. Right. And so my prayer is, even as we're going through this secret place series, that again, it's not just informational gathering that we're doing, that we're quoting scriptures and looking at, you know, what the Lord says and now we know stuff. God is speaking to us so that we can become who he has designed us from the beginning of time to be in this day and age. I was reading a commentary last night, and it was talking about the difference between revelation and knowledge. Because if all we do is attain knowledge, then we've just got a lot of smart sinners. <laughs> People that know things. But just because you know something, unless it is changing your behavior right, right. and changing your understanding of who you are who God wants you to be, then you're just smart. But we're still lost. So we go to St. John chapter 15. I'm sorry. John chapter 17. I wrote down 15, but we're going to 17. This is Jesus praying. And again, I want you all to pray with me and for me because there's something in this message, kind of at the heart of it, that is still being processed in my mind. And I know that that may be a, a, a strange place for a pastor preaching a sermon to be. But the subject matter of glory, 
like I said earlier, when we talk about global, we have this perception maybe of just the brilliance of God, the brightness of God, because that all time is the capacity that we use it in. But there's something I discovered. I've been taking my own advice and the word of God's advice of finding treasure in a field. I've been digging. I've been praying. The Lord has been leading me to different things in His Scripture that is causing me to analyze and to reassess things that I thought that I knew. Because when Jesus talks about the treasure that's hidden in a, in, in a field, and He talks about the man who was looking for pearls of great price, there's something in that parable, something in that story that is required of us because when the person who is looking for goodly pearls and when the person who finds treasure in a field, the one thing they have in common is that when they found it, they went and sold everything they had to purchase the field. And I believe that there's some things that when God reveals deeper truths to us, that there may be some things that we are going to have to let go of right, right, right. in order to embrace what he's saying in the moment. I'm not talking about changing sound doctrine. I'm not talking about the fundamental components of what it means to be a believer in Christ. But sometimes we attach ourselves to things and notions that may not have any biblical or spiritual reference. How many of you have ever heard the term Shekinah glory? Four of y'all. In reading a commentary on last night, I found out that the actual word Shekinah doesn't show up in the Bible at all. It is actually a construct of religious leaders, of the, the priests who put two words together to make the word Shekinah. And so I preached in the church about Shekinah glory, not knowing that the word doesn't exist in scripture. It talks about the dwelling place of the Lord, but the word itself. So there's some things in church practice that we have attached ourselves to, like the word glory. When you hear the word glory, what, what, what do you think when you hear it? Do you think of the splendor? Of God, of course you do, because that's how it's used. But there's something in this. And Lord, I'm praying for us, for me, to get to this thing. So let's read the prayer of Jesus. And realize right now that at this time in Jesus' life, Jesus is hours away from betrayal. He's hours away from his arrest. He's hours away from going to the cross, suffering a horrendous death and being buried in a borrowed tomb. So as he's praying, the disciples are eavesdropping. They're listening as he's praying. And as I've tried to say to you, everything that Jesus is doing, there's a lesson in it. That we can listen to a prayer and know the prayer, or maybe we can extract some information from the prayer that might help us. So let's, with that in mind, St. John chapter 17, verse 1. And it's hard for me to start with verse 1 because it said, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Chapter 16 ends with this verse, verse 33. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. The title of this message is the prayer of Jesus. Jesus prayed and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your 
your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus is saying in this portion of this prayer that his purpose on earth has been fulfilled. He's saying, Lord, I have done what you've given me to do. For these three years I have preached. For these three years I have worked miracles. For these three years I have sought to disciple and shape and teach these 12 men, one of which was destined from the beginning to be my betrayer. But I have done what you called me to do, and now this leg of the journey is over. But he uses the word glory and glorify over and over in this complete prayer. And because I kept seeing the word glory and glorify, I just counted how many times I found in this prayer the word glory and glorify showed up. And if my count is correct, it shows up nine times. Now, nine may or may not have any specific meaning to anybody, but, but and I know we need to be careful as we deal with numbers and numerology and stuff, but there are specific meanings for numbers in Scripture, like the number three and the number 12 and the number seven. There is definite biblical references to these numbers. And so I was just wondering if there was any reference to the number nine. And the, the number nine speaks to completion or finality. That here at the end of Jesus' life, he makes mention of this word glory and glorify nine times. And the meaning of nine is finality. Jesus is saying that my work is done. That what I have imparted to these people in this time period is all that they're going to get right now. That they hopefully have learned what they need to learn and have understood what they need to understand because I'm going to move on and leave them here. And so when we start looking at this word glory again, I want us to get a grasp. Lord, I, I, man. Hmm. The word glory. Media team, roll with me. Because I'm trying to roll in the spirit. The word glory comes from a Greek word, doxa. D-O-X-A. And when I looked up the word in a commentary, I have to admit, I was... Depressed is not the right word. I wasn't excited about what I found the meaning of the word was. Because I expected glory to be what I thought glory was, which is brightness and brilliance and power and majesty. And the Greek word doxa doesn't lend itself to that. So when we talk about doxa, when we talk about glory, I think we need to have a better understanding. Because when I think of the glory of God again, I think about the brilliance, the majesty, and just the, the inapproachable light of who God is. But the word that the translators decided to use from Greek doesn't really lend itself to that kind of definition. The word doxa means that which gives the proper opinion of someone or something. Somebody's got the reading the scripture. So when I see the word doxa, it says that which gives the proper opinion of someone or something, and it comes from the root to think. Now, if I was to do just a word study on that word, and see that the word glory in its original context in Greek has to do with my opinion and what I think. To me, that kind of diminishes my idea of glory. Because the glory actually has to do with opinions uh -huh. and what people think. Mm -hmm. Then glory becomes subjective to what we want to make it. My opinion now matters when it comes to God's glory. What I think glory is actually defines what God's glory is. Y'all stay with me in the room. I'm actually going somewhere with this. Because when Jesus says, Father, I have glorified your name. Now, give me the glory that I had with you. It is more than just my opinion about that. And when I think about that, but it has more to do with what God actually means when he uses the word glory. If glory 
again is just the brilliance of God, then glory be becomes just this abstract light that really has no direction and no purpose other than to keep us from approaching God. Help me, Father God. I didn't go to seminary, so I'm just using this thing by the Spirit of God. But the word doxa, the Greek word, is translated from a Hebrew word kabod. Now, kabod, K-A-B-O-D, actually means heavy or weighty. So in the Old Testament, when I read the word glory, it means the weight. It means the heaviness. It means the substantive presence of a God who is more than just a bright ball of light in the sky. Amen. But he is actually the power that gives that light its meaning. Help me, Holy Ghost. Because if God, again, is just an abstract power that exists in the distance like the sun, then we will not be able to approach God for who he actually is. Amen. So when Jesus prays, Lord, I have given you glory, and the glory that I've given you, according to the Greek translators, has to do with your opinion of me. God's opinion of Jesus, by giving him glory, was manifested in who he really was. So it's not my opinion of who God is. It's God's opinion of who I am. And so Jesus said, I'm going to go back and read this thing because he said, Father, glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. For you grant him authority over all people that he may give eternal life to all those whom you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ with you. Have said, I have brought you glory. In other words, Lord, I have made you known to the world. Not just have I added to your brilliance and your brightness. But I have brought your opinion of who you are right, right. and who I am Amen. to the earth in my physical frame. Amen. So who I am, who Jesus is, how he lived his life really was the embodiment of God's opinion of himself. That God's opinion of himself was so great that he had to put it in a body to express himself to a world that can't approach who God is in his brilliance. So the word doxa now be becomes much more of a focal point. Not that limits who God is, but actually explains God. Because for so many people, God is still an abstract concept. We know enough about him. I can't see him. I can't, uh, I can't uh, uh, approach him. I don't know everything, anything uh, about him. So the word doxa now makes it a definition of the opinion. That which gives a proper opinion of someone or something. Stay with me now. The word doxa is taken from the word dokeo, which means to think. I told you all I needed your prayers in this thing. So God's glory or his doxa gives us a proper opinion of who he really is. Because the glory of God is defined not only in his brilliance but in his person. That's why when we look at God in the Old Testament, God always looked like a fire that you could not approach. God always dwelt in a glory that nobody could really understand. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. He had already seen God's brilliance because he had been on the mountain. Right. He had been there and he actually was glowing with God's presence. But now Moses said, Lord, show me your weight. Show me your might. Show me your substance. And God said, you can't see that and live. And that stands true today. We can't see the weight, the majesty, right. the kabod of God. So God had to wrap up his kabod. Yeah. God had to wrap up his kabod self in his doxa self mm -hmm. so that we can understand what God's opinion of himself really is. Because God's opinion of himself comes from how God views himself. You see, God views himself as God. God views himself as eternal. God views himself as the all-sustaining one. Don't need nobody. Don't need nothing. I am that I am. And if you can't deal with that, you can't deal with me. God is a God who does not need to explain himself to anybody but 
but he reveals himself in doctrine. Because Jesus said that the glory, the word glory is doctrine, that you gave me, the opinion that you had of me before the world began, I now have shown that to them. But I've shown it to them in this frame. Because they can't see you in your frame. Going somewhere with this. Don't forget the word doxa has to deal with the word dokeo, which means to think. Remember when Jesus... Yeah, y'all just forget points. <laughs> Remember when Jesus was transfigured when he was transformed before them, where he took Peter, James, and John mm -hmm. and said, fellas, i got to show you something. And the Bible says that Jesus was transfigured before them and his face began to shine like the sun. That's our image of glory. Right. When we say that Jesus was glorified or glory filled, we see him in that unbridled glory, but the word is not used in that context. It says that Jesus was transfigured. And the word, again, the Greek word for that is metamorpho. Something like it. From where we get our word metamorphosis. And that exact same word that Jesus was transfigured or metamorphoso is the exact same word that Paul says is supposed to happen to us. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, my brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be ye transformed. It is the exact same word of transfiguration. Transfiguration means to change from one thing into another. And when Jesus was transfigured, they saw the doxa. They saw the expression of God's opinion in the person of Jesus Christ. But then he began to glow and to shine in the kabod of God. And they were blown away. The reason I'm saying this is that if you have to know what you're talking about, when you talk about giving God glory, you cannot give God more light. Because God is light. And in Him there is no, no darkness at all. So when we sing songs giving glory, what are you giving God? You are honoring the opinion of God as King of kings and Lord of lords. My opinion of who He is now supersedes everything else in my life. He now becomes the one who I give glory to, I give assent to, I give everything I am to because he alone is worthy to receive glory because he has revealed his opinion of who God is. In the earth. Hey, sir. See, I didn't do too well in school. I was the greatest student. My attention span or whatever it is. And so whatever is coming out of me right, right now, my prayer is, yes, it is. is the Spirit of God who said, who said that He will teach you. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, I've done some study in the, in the, in the commentary. But I was wondering why, well, why the word dox, doxa doesn't seem to express my understanding of glory. Because if you keep on reading, the Bible says that Jesus prays and said, Lord, the glory that you gave me, I gave them. So I was wondering, like, where's my shine? I'm looking, for, I'm looking to look in the mirror, man, and start glowing like Moses because my understanding of glory has been twisted. So how can I give God something that I don't know what it is? We've got churches trying to give God glory. You're trying to make God brighter. <laughs> You're trying to make God big. You're trying to make God gleam a little more in this dark world. And so preachers will talk about giving glory. But the word glory that they chose to use 
was not kebab. It's doxa. And doxa is the opinion that someone gives or has about something or someone. God's opinion doesn't show up only in how he treats Jesus or how he treats us. It's how he shows up in our lives. Right. See, our opinion is based on our feelings and our emotions and our understanding. God is not limited like we are. So when God has an opinion of you, uh -huh. the way you live reflects his opinion. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. The power in your life affects his opinion. Your dedication to him in prayer. And the effectiveness of your prayers manifesting is God's opinion of you. God shows his opinion by giving you favor in areas of your life when no one else has what you have. Hey, hey. I know that, I see, what some folks are doing, you are trying to unlearn some things. Right now some folks are struggling with what they thought glory was and what Jesus says it is. But he's praying, Father God, I have glorified you. And I'm praying to receive the glory that I had with you before I came. What was God's opinion of Christ before he became Jesus? He was the word. He was the expression, the living spiritual expression of God. That when God had an idea, Jesus brought it to pass. Yeah. If I was a keep on reading. Jesus said, Father, I have protected them by your word and by my name. The protection that we have in this world comes to us because of God's opinion of who Jesus is. So when I speak in his name, God brings to pass everything that he thinks about Jesus in my life when I speak his word. Because the fulfillment of God's word, as I put it to work, is the evidence that God's opinion of who I am merits his moving on my behalf. All right. Yes. Drop down to verse 11. I remain in the world no longer, but they're still in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture might be fulfilled. My Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Yeah. The righteous run into it and is safe. My safety is in my understanding of who Jesus really is today. Not just the historic Jesus of 2,000 years ago, but the glory that has been revealed in his word as to who he is. We can make Jesus out to be whoever we want him to be. But Jesus said, I am the express image of who God is. And God's express image is showed up in the glory that you see in me. But my glory is not just in the brilliance of light. It says who I am in my Father's heart. Yes. I am the living expression yes. of God in the earth. Now, Jesus, when he was transfigured, showed the supernatural aspect of who he was. Mm -hmm. By being transformed, metamorphoso, from one thing to another. Hallelujah. But here's what the Bible says about us is that as our minds change, as the information stream changes, we become transformed to look just like Him. So when you walk in this world, and Jesus said, I have given you my glory, stop trying to glow in the dark. <laughs> and realize that the way you live is an expression of God's opinion of you right. in the earth. Amen. Yeah. 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 
This might not be shallow stuff for some folks, but this is the word. Amen. Doxa has less to do with brilliant light than it does with being the living expression of what God thinks about you in the earth. And we are com commanded and instructed that we can be transformed. We can have the metamorphosis yes. of being who we used to be into who God wants us to be if we change the information that we're processing. That's good. See, like I said, sometimes in class, I wasn't too good in, in class. Some folks in church <laughs> would rather shout and dance and go along with what we used to think then find out what God is actually saying. With all due respect, I see all these video clips. And I, I, I get it, because I like dancing in church. But I'm seeing dancing, hearing hooping, seeing folks falling out all over the place. But the communities in which these churches are planted are still dangerous to walk the streets of Families are still broken. Drugs and alcohol are running rapid. Or we in here thinking that we're in God's kabod. Uh -huh. And God is trying to give us dox. What is the world's opinion of Jesus based upon the people that represent him in the world? Are more people coming to who God really is or are they flocking to churches looking for kabod? And God is trying to give the world his doctrine. God's opinion of you is reflected best in how you represent Jesus in the world. You may not be casting out devils. You may not be walking on water. But the doxa glory of God is God's opinion of his people expressed in our spiritual lives. All right. Jesus said, I, can, I have given you glory. I didn't make God brighter. I've shown the world what you think about me right. because I represent you. So what people think about you, child of God, matters. That's why they listen to you talk when you tell them you're a Christian. That's why they watch what you do mm -hmm. when they tell right. when you right. tell them you're right. a Christian. Because not by watching you on Sunday, mm -hmm. but by watching you through the week, mm -hmm. they are forming an opinion not only of you, but of the God that you serve. Yeah. 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 And so the docks of glory of God, the opinion of God is tainted. Not because of who God is, right, right. but because of who we are. Jesus lived as the greatest expression of God in the earth one, while wrapped in a physical body. And the Bible says that we are supposed to look just like him on earth. The way you live for God is first of all the expression of your opinion of who he is. Because if your opinion of God is not that he is wonderful, merciful, gracious, and kind, you'll say what the world says. You'll do what the world does. You will act and live like you don't know him. Because my opinion of him is not that high. And so I now become the reflection of your opinion of who God is. And my calling on earth is to be the reflection of who God is so that that changes your opinion, not necessarily of me, but of who he is. Did that make sense at all? Yeah.
saying, I, I don't get it. I just don't want you to do it. I want you to go and do like I did. I want you to go and look up the word glowing. What it means in our context. And you'll find it's light and brilliance and it's that. Then find out what the Bible calls it. D-O-X-A. The opinion of something or someone. And the root of the word is to think. What you think about something or someone. And Jesus said, I have given God glory. Because by watching me, the way you think about God has to be incredible. Because God works miracles through my life. God does incredible things and keeps me in incredible ways. So your opinion of my God based upon who I live has to be, man, I don't really like that book. That says it gets on my nerves. But God shows up all the time. <laughs> because of people's opinion of God is diminished because of their opinion of you. Then you are not walking in glory. You're walking in religion. You're walking in self-righteousness. You're walking in something else. Jesus prayed, Lord, I have given them the glory, the doxing, the opinion of who you are. Just like you gave me the glory, the doxing, the opinion of who you are. And therefore, it's up to us if you want glory to manifest in your life. Your opinion of God has to be elevated. And the higher you think of God, the more God is going to show up in your life and do the miraculous. Not just to bless you, but so that others will see God in you. Let your light so shine before men that they might see what you do. And by that, they will glorify. Yes. They will doxify. They will commodify the God that you serve. My prayer is that the Spirit of the living God will help you process this information. Again, not just as you hear it, but as you go and look for yourself. Look at the Word. Pray over this thing yourself. And my prayer is that God will reveal more of who He is and who He desires to be in your life. Amen. Father God, in Jesus' name, Father, I have been an imperfect vessel stumbling through, but walking, I pray, at the direction of your Spirit. You said, oh God, that glory is ours that we have it. But our understanding, Lord, has to be as clear as the glory is. You call us, O oh God, to represent you in the earth. That our opinion of you must be reflected in how we live our lives. Amen. So that those who watch us will have an opinion of how awesome our God is. I pray, Lord, that eyes would be open. I pray, oh God, that hearts might be receptive. I pray that the glory of God be manifest in the lives of your people. The heavy weight, the kabod of your presence, but also, oh Father God, the doxa, the way that we live that shapes the opinions of others. But what others think about us, Lord, is far less important about what you think of us. When your opinion of us is as it was with Jesus, then everything that he had becomes ours. Everything that he did, we can do. Everything he accomplished, we will accomplish. For greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
glory is no less powerful than Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the unbridled glory of an infinite God who is as a consuming fire beyond our understanding. But God wrapped up all of that powerful glory, crammed it into a little body by the name of Jesus Christ, and put him into the world to represent him. Not in brilliance and shining, but in the everyday living. So people's opinion of this man reflected who God is in the earth. People need to see just everyday men and women. Watch this. That's why Jesus didn't call great world leaders. He called businessmen, fishermen, tax collectors. And he said, now go out into the world and represent me well. Because people's opinion of you as you represent me is more a reflection of their understanding of who God is than trying to make sense of you. I'm trying to make sense of somebody that makes no sense. And yet you see God working in their life. My opinion of you might be you crazy, but I know the God you serve is incredible. If you're in this place today and you don't have that relationship with Christ, it begins by simply saying yes to God. By saying, Lord, apart from you, I'm separate. I have no right even to call you Father. But if you'll confess with your mouth the Lordship of Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead right here, right now. Bible you will be saved. For the heart, you believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. If, like our dear sister, you've been away from God, you know how good God has been, but it's time for you to come to yourself and come back home. You went the Bible calls a backslide. means you've slid away. But God is married to a backslider. You haven't lost relationship, just fellowship. Come back to Him, and He'll restore you. Don't have a church home? We've got room in this place. We are all in this thing, reflecting the glory of God in the various levels that He gives to each one of us. But it's all about what is your opinion of God? Is He worthy of your life? Is He worthy of your gifts? Is He worthy of your calling? Because your opinion of Him reflects in the glory that He gives you. If you're in this place as we all stand to our feet, will you come and get saved for the first time? Will you come and recommit your life to Jesus? Or will you simply say, I want to become part of this fellowship? Come on, for the world.
down into your spirit so that we're not just throwing glory out there anymore. It's not just God's brilliance. It's the living expression of God's opinion of himself in the person of Jesus living in you. Now, what is your opinion of God? Let that be reflected in this week, in what you say, what you do, and where you go for God's glory. Just prayer. We're going to pray for our dear sister Linda. Bring her on over here. Stretch your hands towards her. Amen. And we thank you. First of all, we thank you for sharing that testimony. Thank you for being honest with God and what God has in store for you. No one can keep from you. You have come to him new and afresh. My prayer is that he's going to show you amazing things. He's going to release glory in your life. Docks of glory, but also that combined glory of his power and presence. Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our sister. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this word. I thank you for your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you, Father God, will make clear what it is you want us to know. What glory really looks like. Help us, Father God, to be more and more like you and meet the needs of our sister, Linda, and everyone else, Lord, who finds themselves in the same place. To God be the glory for the things he has done. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. <laughs>